All right, in this video, we're gonna to touch on a bit of the neuroscience of hearing, and then we'll get a little deeper into the neuro stuff in the next video. So remember that the perceptual process starts when some physical energy from the environment reaches our sensory receptors. In this case, they're deep in our ears and gets transduced into neurons firing. So we'll start there, and then later we'll see where the signal goes when it travels into the brain for further processing, at which point we'll actually hear something and experience the sound. So before it can ever get transduced, the sound wave has to get deep into our ears. The, the place where it gets transduced is deep in the inner ear. So here's a simple diagram of the ear from, from sort of left where the sound wave is to right would be deeper into the ear. You'll notice there's a lot of stuff that goes on beyond the fleshy flap that we usually refer to when we say, you know, someone has big ears or small ears, right? The visible outer part of the ear. So let's talk about the, the bits of the ear that we have to go through and why they're there in order to get to the inner ear where the sensory receptors are. So first there's the outer ear, which consists of that fleshy bit we can see, that's called the pinna, and also the auditory canal, you know, where you should definitely not be shoving Q-tips. And then at the end of that canal is the eardrum. Uh, then there's the middle ear, the next step in the middle ear right beyond that. It's a chamber that has three tiny little bones that we call ossicles that get vibrated by the eardrum. And those bones pass on the vibration to the inner ear. The, specifically the cochlea, the part that we're trying to get to. So finally then there's the inner ear and for hearing, for the sense of hearing, the only part that we were really gonna care about is the cochlea in the inner ear. That's the snail shell looking spiral thing in green here in the picture. The cochlea is a fluid filled tube which is gonna receive those vibrations we got earlier. The vibrations have been passed along. And those vibrations are gonna cause kind of waves, kind of sloshing inside the cochlea that'll activate little, little hair cell neurons, specialized neurons, which are the things that actually fire in action potential. The neurons that actually fire when the waves brush against them, when the sloshing from those vibrations uh, activates them. So let's zoom in on each of these parts briefly to get from the outer ear deep into the inner ear. So first, just what is the outer ear stuff for? Um, the pinna exists largely to, to funnel and amplify and, and to direct sound into the auditory canal. We'll come back to, to some of its uses in, in a couple later videos. The auditory canal is there mostly for protection, like it catches gunk and bugs, and it's where you'll find earwax, sometimes called a cerumen. Uh, but it also resonates to amplify sounds in the roughly 1,000 to 5,000 hertz range. We'll see again, that's an important um, range of frequencies that humans are good at hearing. It's what we talk in. Uh, so it, it actually has some perceptual um, functions in the auditory canal. And then the eardrum at the end, it passes on those vibrations, right? The air vibrations, or if you're in water, right, it'd be water vibrations, but it passes that on by vibrating the bones in the middle ear. So let's go into the middle ear. In the middle ear, those three bones I talked about uh, they're called the malleus, the incus, and the stapes, or sometimes you'll hear people just call them the hammer, anvil, anvil, and stirrup. They actually do a lot of work. They act as levers. And we know from physics that all levers give a mechanical advantage to help exert force. So the reason this is so important is if we go directly from, let's say, an air medium, like vibrations out in the air from the sound waves, go directly from that to the liquid that we have inside the cochlea, we would actually lose 99% of vibrations. Most of that energy would go away. We'd have trouble hearing anything. So instead, we go from this big eardrum to this tiny little stapes, which is gonna increase pressure by about 20 times in order to make up for that, that loss as we go into the liquid later. So it's a, it's a way of making up for what would otherwise be a bunch of lost energy. Now, just as a side note, one other interesting thing about the middle ear, it actually has some muscles to automatically, so unconsciously, out of your control, but just automatically it'll react to and then kind of dampen some loud sounds. Uh, unfortunately, it can't protect, protect against sudden loud noises, like a gunshot suddenly going off or suddenly like cranking the crap up on, a, you know, turn on your headphones without realizing how high they are. Rather, the muscles are more like for adjusting, kind of slowly adjusting when you're in a consistently loud situation, like in a car on the freeway or something like that. 
Okay, finally the part we really care about where we want all these vibrations to get because then we can actually turn it into neurons firing. That's in the inner ear. And again, the part we, we want to focus on is the cochlea. The cochlea, that fluid-filled tube that receives those vibrations. Um, vibrations from the bones, the, the malleus incus and stapes, they're going to they're gonna come in at the base of the cochlea, so the start of the cochlea. In other words, right at the start here, or you can kind of see in this diagram here on this side, where the, the last bone kind of attaches here, that's the base or the start of the cochlea, the start of that, again, it would spiral a bunch. Here they don't show all the spirals, but it would spiral around. So that's the base where things come in at something called the oval window. And then those, so right here, and then those vibrations are gonna travel around through the cochlea. They're gonna travel through the liquid down the spiral until they get to the end, which is called the, the apex, kind of the, the tip of the, the cochlea. So the apex is the tip at the center of the spiral. Um, again, the, the idea here is that the vibrating liquid, vibrating at a particular frequency, is going to activate some little neurons, some little hair cell looking neurons, which are the sensory receptors for hearing. And those are throughout sort of the center, the middle of this cochlea. So here's a diagram at the, at the top right here is a diagram that you can imagine just if we kind of unrolled the cochlea, right? It's normally in a spiral all wrapped up. But if you unwrapped it and made it all straight, just you know, during an autopsy or something, this is kind of what you would see. You'd see it's a tube, again, going from the base where the sound first comes in, where the stapes is at this oval window, the base all the way down to the tip, the apex, that normally would be in the center of that rolled up spiral. What they've labeled here, the scale of vestibuli, scale of tympani, don't worry about those. They're just outer chambers. The important part for us, though, is going to be through the middle here, a sort of middle layer, a middle chamber running between them. So let's zoom in a little bit. What we've got here, we've kind of zoomed in and done a cutaway of the cochlea, like a slice of the cochlea, as if you're looking down the tube, into the tube. Notice that in the middle chamber, right, here's those outer chambers I talked about, the scala, the scala, don't worry about those. But in this middle chamber, there's some interesting stuff going on here. The floor at the bottom, that's called the basilar membrane. You can think basilar kind of like base, right? It's the base membrane, the base of the, where this interesting stuff's going to happen. And on the basilar membrane there, it's like it's, it's movable. It's a membrane. It's kind of movable. And as the, the vibrating happens, the sloshing of the liquid, it's going to kind of vibrate up and down during that sloshing. And it has hair cells attached to it. So these hair cells labeled in the picture here, these hair cells, those are neurons. They're a special type of neuron. They're actually sensory neurons or sensory receptors attached to it. And they have little cilia, little kind of fuzzy hair things sticking out at the end there. Those get sloshed around. So as the pressure waves pass through the liquid inside here, the cilia get sloshed around. They're going to rub against, there's actually a sort of upper membrane here called the tectorial membrane, but they're just going to, they're going to slosh and rub against this other membrane. And it's that sloshing and rubbing around that's going to um, physically activate these hair cells, these special neurons. The physical movement of the hair cells is actually what will cause them to fire action potentials. So to fire as neurons into some attached neurons nearby. Well, we kind of see these wires going out here. These are auditory neurons. These are, these are neurons going out the auditory nerve. Nerve, auditory nerve is just like a bundle of, of neurons, a bundle of fibers going to your brain to bring things from the ear into the brain. And so basically once any of these get activated, they activate a neighboring cell in the auditory nerve, a neighboring neuron that passes the signal on to the brain. So it's the, again, the, the physical movement of the hair cells that causes them to fire, that causes them to, to send a signal to the auditory nerve where it then goes to the brain. Now, when these little hair cells, again, the sensory neurons, the hair cells that are attached to the basilar membrane, when they get sloshed or kind of rubbed in a certain direction, the way that they're firing as neurons, what makes them actually do something interesting and, and become a firing neuron is when they get sloshed in the right direction, it's physically, it's mechanically stretching open some little channels, some little openings we call ion channels. And they're called ion channels just because they let in ions or charged particles, like little, little particles that have a, you know, a positive or a negative uh, electricity to them. So for example, when these stretch open, they might let in a bunch of K plus, which is potassium. And again, the plus means it's electrically positive. 
uh, or Ca+, which is calcium, again, positively charged uh, calcium ions. So it's like opening these up um, at these little ion channels. You can see the flow here in the arrows on the left. It's pulling those positive ions inside of the neuron. If we can get these little openings, these little ion channels pulled open. And we'll see how that happens. It's basically like the sloshing of the liquid. You can imagine the liquid sloshes in the proper direction. Uh, it, it's going to like stretch open those channels. How? Well, because each of these these little ion channels here that we can see, they're actually connected to a nearby bit of hair, a nearby bit of cilia, by what we call tip links, just these little connectors here. So you can imagine, because these are connected, they might be kind of loose here, they're not very taut, right? It's not very tight right now. It's kind of loose and dangling when they're just sitting at a resting state. So that's not enough to pull open this ion channel. But if you slosh all of these little cilia, all these little bits of hair, slosh them all in one direction, like to the right, then that little tip link is going to be pulled taut, right? It's going to be tight and it's going to pull on the edge. It's going to actually pull open this ion channel of the neighboring little opening here. And then that also has its own tip link to the next one, which will pull open the next one. And so all of those will pull open and that's when these positive ions like potassium and calcium will flood inside the cell, inside the neuron. And that, if it's open enough, right? If enough of those come in, then that'll cause the neuron to fire. It'll, it'll release neurotransmitter, go to the next neuron. So why does this work this way? Well, neurons in a, in a resting state, when a neuron is just sitting there and not firing, when a neuron's just chilling and waiting, a neuron's in their resting state, they're, we call them polarized because they're actually at a negative electrical state. They're not at zero, they're polarized, meaning away from zero, right? Non-neutral. Um, so specifically, they sit there negative, about 70, negative 70 millivolts. And so they're sitting there negative, they're only gonna fire an action potential if the inside of the neuron, the inside of the cell can get more positive, in other words, less polarized, we call it getting depolarized, basically if they become not as negative inside, they're starting at negative 70. If we can make them not quite so negative, then it can start a chain reaction inside that makes the neuron fire. So we need to get some positive, we need to get some pluses inside to make a neuron fire because it starts at negative 70, we've got to undo that. So opening the ion channels, if they slosh in the right direction, that makes the hair cell fire. That makes the hair cell get positive enough inside, makes the neuron go pew, 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 and send a signal, which again means it's communicating with its neighbor neuron. It sends neurotransmitters out to that nearby auditory nerve cell, right? A neuron audit in the, the auditory nerve, that bundle of neurons that goes to the brain. Here's just another depiction of the same thing. Because the, slo the sloshing uh, in the in the correct direction will literally pull those tip links taut right they're here they're they're kind of loose they're not being pulled but if the sloshing in this case all goes to the left if the water is sloshing all these to the left then it will pull open it'll, it'll make these tighter and it'll pull open those tip links and open the ion channels letting all the plus stuff in it's a mechanism for mechanically opening the neuron mechanically activating the neuron you can actually see on the right here this is a microscope image of a hair cell with all its little cilia over in, on the on the right here and and it's a bit hard to see but if you zoom in on this or find the image online zoom in a little further you can actually see little tip links connecting those cilia so it's a little hard to see but there are little tip links connecting each of those all right um, here's just another depiction of the same thing just to make sure it's clear as you can see at the top here the more that they get bent the further they get bent so the bigger the force is if there's a lot of force to the right for example then you're going to get a high rate of firing whereas of course if it sloshes in the opposite direction if it's sloshing in the wrong direction then it's going to slow down the firing rate so basically we're going to be able to track high and low pressure changes cycling high low high low high low maybe say 200 times per second for a 200 hertz frequency by it sloshing to the right and activating a lot and then sloshing back to the left and activating a little and then back to the right and back to the left a lot a little a lot a little maybe say 200 times per second and that would code that would tell the brain about a 200 hertz sound that was out there in the world and the more that these are sloshed the more they're bent the harder the the force uh, the more the neuron will fire so it'll go like pew 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 pew, pew instead of just like a slow rate of pew 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 right Okay, so let's let's summarize real quick how we got from sound waves out there in the air to uh, uh, some neurons firing. That's the actual transduction process for our sense of hearing. 
starts with the pressure waves on the air. Again, they have a certain frequency, a certain amplitude, and specifically, it's usually a complex tone, so it's actually a bunch of different combo frequencies coming into our ear at different amplitudes for each of those frequencies. It comes in through the outer ear, the pinna, auditory canal, and eardrum, goes through those ossicles just passing along, right, the middle ear bones, they're just passing along the vibration to the oval window, which is the, the entrance of the fluid-filled cochlea, and then what we really care about is they're inside the cochlea, the middle layer is the basilar membrane, that's what we care about. The basilar membrane is bouncing up and down, causing its hair cells to stretch and to rub against that other membrane. Uh, and then those hair cells, which again are our sensory neurons for hearing, they fire from stretching open their ion channels, and that's what sends a signal to the brain. It goes out the auditory nerve, goes to the brain, and that's when we'll eventually actually hear and experience something. We'll be like, oh, I'm hearing something, and maybe recognize what it is. Now, I realize something like the basilar membrane doesn't sound very exciting, but there's some really interesting shit going on here. So interesting, in fact, that the person who figured out the basilar membrane won a Nobel Prize for it back in 1961. So it turns out the basilar membrane, it actually vibrates more at different places depending on the frequency of the sound that's coming in. So the, the base of the cochlea, the base at the start, where the basilar membrane is first coming in the cochlea there, the base at the entrance, it's narrower and stiffer and actually makes it only vibrate to high frequencies, the highest frequencies. So like the very first few neurons coming in here, the very first few hair cells at the start there, those only vibrate to like 20,000 hertz sounds. And right past that are ones that only vibrate to, let's say, 18,000 hertz sounds. And further in are ones that only vibrate to 2,000 hertz sounds. And then as we get further and further towards the tip, towards the, the, right, the inner middle part of that spiral, uh, the apex at the far end, then it's a little wider. The basilar membrane is wider. Uh, and it actually only vibrates then to lower frequencies, like 100 hertz or even down to like 25 or 20 hertz is probably the lowest, fre lowest frequency a human can hear. So in other words, the basilar membrane is actually laid out in this incredibly nice orderly fashion. And this lets it act as a filter. So the early auditory nerves only fire for higher frequency sound. Down here, you get our 18,000, 19,000 hertz sounds. We'll make these neurons fire. Then we got some neurons here that only fire for 4,000 hertz sounds. And neurons here that only fire for, you know, 100 or 200 or 300 hertz sounds. So early auditory nerves then, the things again that come out of those hair cells, they connect to the auditory nerve fibers going to the brain. Early auditory nerves are themselves only going to fire for high frequency sounds. So the wires that come out down here are only going to go off if there was a really high frequency sound. And the wires going to the brain from out here at the end of the apex, those will only be firing if the little detector neurons at the end near the apex here were going off, which again, only happens for low frequency sounds. So if these wires, these auditory nerve wires going out to the brain that are connected here, right? If they're going out to the brain, if they're firing, that'll only happen because there was low frequency sound out there in the world by which the neuron is getting its you know, signal from. So remember, the brain doesn't receive physical sound. The brain doesn't receive vibrations directly. For vision, light doesn't get into the brain. We don't have a bunch of light waves bouncing around inside the brain. We don't have a bunch of sound waves bouncing around inside the brain either. The brain literally only ever gets pew, 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 pew. That's all it gets is just a bunch of different rates of different neurons firing or not firing at particular times. But it has this orderly wiring like we see here with the, with the layout of the basilar membrane and thus the layout of the auditory nerve neurons coming out of there. That orderly wiring like that lets the brain know which neuron is firing, which tells us what physical thing is out there in the world. And that only works because of this orderly layout of something like the basilar membrane. We actually have a term for this orderly layout. It's called a tonotopic map. Right, tonotopic, just like it has the base, the root word tone there. So a map based on tones. In this case, similar frequencies lead to firing of neurons that are right next to each other on the basilar membrane there in the cochlea. So the cochlea has a sort of logical mapping of sound frequencies. The neurons that go off for 700 hertz are right next to the neurons that go off for 800 hertz, right? Here's the actual cochlea with its actual wrapping, its actual spiral shape all the way down to the apex. But notice again, it's laid out. So 
we've got neurons again it's just a bundle of it's got a bunch of like hair cells along the way on the basilar membrane here these are just neurons for picking up sounds but the ones that go off for 20,000 Hertz would all be right next to each other here on the base the ones that detect 17,000 Hertz sounds would all be right next to each other just a little bit further in the ones that detect 6,000 or 7,000 Hertz sounds there are a bunch of neurons kind of neighbors to each other for neighboring frequencies and so on all the way in there so the the you know the the neurons that go off for, for um, you know, 6,000 hertz will be right next to the ones that go off for 7,000 hertz. High frequencies all near the base, low frequencies all near the apex, the, the far inside tip of the spiral. Now, importantly, as we'll see soon, the neurons in the brain maintain this same mapping, the same tonotopic mapping, and that's what will allow the brain to make sense of the sounds that come into it and keep track of what was going on out there in the world, even though all the brain is going to have access to is pew, 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 pew from different neurons. So, okay, let's, let's see a video example of this real quick. This video is going to make things a little more clear. You'll see them. Here's the, the cochlea here, kind of in red, wrapped up like a little snail shell, a little spiral. You'll see them zoom in on the inside of the cochlea and show the basilar membrane. And they're going to kind of unroll it for us, like I talked about earlier, just to make it easier to see what's happening. But I want you to watch where on the basilar membrane gets activated for low pitch sounds versus high pitched sounds, okay? So first it's just going to zoom in, we go through the outer ear, past the bones, into the inner ear, and here it's going to unfurl or unwrap the cochlea just to make it a little easier to see. And here's the basilar membrane from base to apex, and then they'll play some sounds. High frequencies near the base. Complex tone. And again, what they're showing is the little wiggles there. That would be basically we're talking about the hair cell neurons in that place getting vibrated, right? That part of the basilar membrane gets vibrated. That's enough to activate the neurons there, which again will only go off for that particular frequency, like 8,000 hertz or, you know, 20,000 hertz or 200 hertz. Um, but what's what I like about this video, what's so funny is while you're watching this video and listening to the to the sound of this video itself, your own basilar membrane was actually carrying out those patterns that you're seeing on the screen. It was actually doing that same thing inside your own ear just while you watched this video. Okay, but here's a snag. It gets a little more complicated because remember that removing a harmonic doesn't change the pitch that we're hearing. Removing a harmonic doesn't change the note that we're hearing. It's still got the same fundamental frequency. But it certainly does change which parts of the basilar membrane vibrate most, right? We'll get a different combo of the basilar membrane firing for 200, 400, 600, and 800 for this complex tone hitting our ear. We're going to have four places on the basilar membrane vibrating. But in this complex tone here, that's the same fundamental frequency. So it's the same note. It'll sound like the same note to us. And yet... Only these three parts of the basilar membrane are vibrating in that case, right? 400, 600, and 800. So it seems like the brain would treat these as two very different sounds, and yet we still hear the same note with the same fundamental frequency. So that tells us our perception of pitch, of, of what note we're listening to and things like that, can't be built just from what places on the ba basilar membrane were stimulated, right? Because we got two different sets of places being stimulated here, and we can come up with a thousand different combos that would all have the same fundamental frequency, a bunch of different places stimulated, but we still hear, we still perceive something similar about all of those. We still perceive them as being the same note. So this, what we might call place coding, encoding the information based on the place in the membrane, which neuron fired, that alone can't explain how we perceive pitch, you know, from just which auditory nerve cells end up firing and, and thus which, you know, which ones turn on when they get to the brain. 
the brain also seems to need something else. It seems to use, there's a lot of evidence, it seems to also use timing information. So what we call temporal coding. And I'm just giving kind of an overview here. We'll come back to this a few times throughout the course. But temporal coding is, is more about the timing of when neurons turn on or some, some timing pattern in the, the firing of, of different neurons. So temporal coding, you can think of it like, since we know the, the fundamental frequency doesn't change, when you change or remove harmonics, right? There's a bunch of different combos where the spacing is always 200. For all of those, the fundamental frequency doesn't change, and that's something about the timing pattern. So the timing pattern of auditory nerve cells, that could give the brain information about pitch, about fundamental frequency. Places needed, right? We still need to know that, that the place is 200, you know, steps of 200 apart, but it also needs that timing information. It needs both. So in other words, place on the basilar membrane isn't alone enough to encode pitch, but place coding, if you combine it with temporal coding, that can. That can give the brain the info we need to understand how we, how we get all of the, the you know, pitch information, frequency information at, at sort of the base level, but also the more timing-based fundamental frequency stuff that gives us, oh, there's a similarity of these notes, an A1, an A2, an A3, and so on. So, okay, that tells us how frequency information including combinations of different harmonics, gets encoded and sent to the brain as neural signals. Pew, 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 right? But how is loudness represented or how is loudness encoded by neurons firing? How does the brain get loudness from the neural, neural signals coming in from the, the auditory nerve neurons? It happens basically in two ways. So one is just a higher uh, firing rate, a higher rate of firing by individual neurons at that spot on the basilar membrane. So any indi individual neuron, if it fires faster or more often, that will be perceived by the brain as a louder sound. And then the other thing is more neurons in the same spot firing. So of course, if you have a loud sound coming in, a bunch of sound coming in, a bunch of amplitude at 2000 Hertz, then all those little 2000 Hertz detectors on the basilar membrane, all the little neurons that only go off for 2000 Hertz sounds, you'll probably have a bunch of them going off for a high amplitude sound coming in at 2000 Hertz, and maybe only a subset or a few of them going off if the 2000 Hertz sound is coming in quiet with low amplitude. So the brain can use that information to then perceive loudness. We then get loudness experience out of those differences in the rate of firing or the number of neurons in that spot on the basilar membrane that are firing. All right. So in the next video, we'll actually see where those neural signals go in the brain and also talk a little bit about damage to the auditory system.